Hello, I'm Dan Jurgen, and I want to welcome you to Sir Week Conversations presented by IHS Market. I'm very pleased today to be talking with Professor Joe Kang, who is the president of the International Gas Union. He's long experienced in the energy business. He's been in the industry. He's been a professor for many decades at Seoul National University. He's been chairman of COGAS, and he's also been an advisor to the Korean government. So, uh, Professor Kang, we welcome you to Sierra Week Conversations. Thank you, Dan, and the kindly in invitation. It's a great honor to having me here, Sierra Week Network Program. Well, it's, uh, it's very timely to have you join us because there's so much discussion about energy and the future of energy and the role of natural gas. Maybe just a quick word about what are the current agenda of the International Gas Union? Well, and the, as you heard, and the, from the IHIA and the roadmap on the 2050, there is a cast uh, bombshell to the gas industry. So we are really and uh, anxious uh, uh, make a stance on that uh, statement. Also, the, that uh, how we survive in the gas industry in this uh, pandemic environment. Right. So, um, how do you see? Let's turn to the to the to the markets, how do you see uh, LNG markets uh, coming out of the pandemic? Well, and thank you for asking, and Dan, and I'm really surprised to see the performance in the year of 2020. Everybody predict that the LNG market is down. But uh, as a result, we see the 12 years continued growth of LNG. 2020 is not exception. This 2020 is an excellent year in terms of the pandemic. And uh, I think this year we uh, did a tremendous uh, performance in this uh, dire situation. Right. So um, it, is, it is striking how uh, the gas industry continued to perform, even though so many people had to work remotely and uh, all the different pressures because of the pandemic. Uh, the IGU has uh, done its big report on uh, the future of LNG, and uh, be very interested to hear what those conclusions are, uh, how the IGU sees uh, the outlook for gas over the longer term. Dan, thank you for asking about the IGU. That gave me an opportunity to introduce uh, what the IGU does. And then and I'm going to get into the, our flagship report, the LNG, and publish it in this month a lot. Last month, IGU is the three global voice of gas. We advocated the attribute of natural gas positively. In the recent statement from the IGU, we extend definition of gas is including renewable, decarbonized gas, and even to the hydrogen. So that is our recent uh, the stance so on the cards. Within that report, what do you see if we go to LNG? Yeah. Uh, what's the outlook for future market demand for LNG? Well, you, as you know, the LNG is, uh, the, is a really have a great advantage over the flexibility and the agility. Because uh, it's uh, under this pandemic, everybody predicts Gas consumption is down like coal and oil, but the LNG is exceptional, outperformed as projected. So that actually, in the year of 2020, under the influence of pandemic, we actually make a progress in terms of consumption, especially and all the oil and the coal is reduced almost 30 percent as the consumption over 2019, but the LNG is different because of the, we do have a huge drop right after the pandemic, but the, this winter is a really in the cold. There is a really spike of a, that, uh, that air gas demand. So thanks to the LNG, we can manage it. This and the huge up and down of the so energy consumption. So in, in the outlook, the IGU outlook, is Asia the main growth market for LNG? Yeah, uh, primary, uh, thanks to China, 
is uh, that the demand side, but the supply side, Australia and the U.S. played a key role to the meeting and the demand from the Asia. So now it's, uh, we can say it's well balanced. The future outlook in terms of LNG is uh, I see the very bright. So you know that uh, I have to say this, that the LNG and the pipeline natural gas is a uh, 30% of uh, world gas uh, production. Only 30% is uh, traded. 10% is LNG, 20% is through the pipeline natural gas. I see the increase of LNG is the outpace compared to the pipeline natural gas. Right. Um, in the work of the IGU and your own thinking about where does gas fit into the goals for decarbonization? Well, and uh, I mean, I have to say, and historically and the uh, contemporary in the future, because our gas has a four core attributes. Energy supply is accessible and the energy supply should be secure and constant, also the affordable. Finally, gas supply is a catalyst for energy transition. So we proved that the attribute uh, natural gas in the past, now, in the future, you know, that, that we always friend with the, the renewables. Right. Yeah, so what is, the, how do you see, uh, that's an interesting comment. How do you see the relationship between uh, growing gas demand and growing renewables? You can see the trajectory on the global energy mix. Two energy sources is increasing. One of them is a renewable. The other one is a natural gas, because uh, you know that, Renewable has a lack of the flexibility, intermittency, and the seasonality. But the gas does not have, because uh, we can provide, we can uh, complement the shortage of a renewable. That's why we call the gas is a partner, as a hand-in-hand -hand partner to the renewables. And I think uh, you see that not only today, but if you look out to 2050, which is only 28 and a half years mm -hmm. away. Mm -hmm. uh, do you see gas continuing to play that role? Well, and I believe so, but the IEA, that uh, roadmap to the 2050 is that they didn't say that. They didn't recognize uh, how gas contribute to energy transition. You know, that uh, we value the IGO stance and uh, we really honored there is an analytical analysis uh, forecast of an energy mix. But uh, we differ on the pathway, how move forward to meet the climate goals. Well, let, I think we should pursue that point a little more. Uh, that was a very dramatic report or scenario, I guess we would say, yeah. that came from the IEA. What is, what's the reaction of the IGU? What's the reaction of your members? What's your reaction uh, to that uh, report, which is, was a big change from where the IEA was before. Well, uh, let me do this. Uh, let me list out uh, the, what the IEA said about uh, the global energy mix. First, is uh, by 2050, 90% of renewable, 10% is uh, the nuclear. Also, 90% of electricity sharing renew the renewable with the windmill and the solar PV. I mean, that given that a present uh, global energy mix is 30% of oil, around 27% of coal, 26% of the natural gas, only less than 10% of renewable. You know, the energy transition is a time consuming, expensive step-by-step -step process. How come you're gonna change it, hold the landscape within, I mean, the less than 30 years? I, I think this is a, a that uh, scenario is a too ambitious and the unpractical given this uh, uh, fact that I uh, explained. Yeah, so uh, really, so I guess what you're saying from your perspective, thinking that it's 28 and a half years, it's unrealistic. What's been the reaction if you can generalize in Korea and Asia to the IEA report? Well, I did report, uh, I mean, the, we shared the value of the IEA. They have to say this, but to meet the new uh, net zero emission, 
I mean, the, this is maybe in the some uh, part of the country in the, the euro make and yeah, the maintain and the, the manage that uh, that the target. But the some of Asian country like the developing underdeveloping country, um, they, they see that this is uh, the global central uh, the policy centralization. That means if you are forced to the uh, sovereign the underdeveloped development country, they see that this is the second wave of the imperialism because they are taking and the, I mean that the, not the IGU and the, as a view of the developing and the underdeveloped country because we do have a charter member and around the IGU from the Asia. Well, that's a very striking comment that um, that the perspective from Brussels and Paris may not work for all countries around the world. Yes, absolutely. I mean, the energy issue is inherited, characteristically inherited with the diversity and the complexity. I mean, the different patients with the different the disease have, should have a different uh, prescription. We don't have a panacea in the energy issue. Right, right. No mm -hmm. and uh, yellow. A brick road, uh, no, and the uh, royal the road in the energy issue. Right, as you say, it's complicated. Well, one thing that has uh, entered the energy road in a significant way, at least in terms of discussion, is hydrogen. Hydrogen has, yeah. of course, been an industrial fuel for a long time, mm -hmm. uh, but hydrogen is a gas as well. So the International Gas Union I means perhaps not only natural gas, but hydrogen gas. Uh, Tell us what your thinking is at this point about the potential role of hydrogen, the timing, the scale. Mm -hmm. Well, and uh, that's one thing for sure. Renewable has a very bright future, including hydrogen. And the world see the new technology, new things is a very and the welcome mode. Just like uh, that uh, really reminds me comparison between the devil and the angel, okay. So the, you know that uh, the, be careful who you trust the most, and uh, that uh, it's a, you, you know the, what I'm saying. It's that, that hydrogen. We have to analyze the property hydrogen very extensive and the accurate way. Hydrogen is for sure future, but the hydrogen can be manufactured. And from the, I see that, that the hydrogen is a secondary energy, not like the natural gas. Energy, secondary energy is a converted from the primary energy or electricity from the, uh, the water with the injection, huge injection of electric, electricity. So I think that according to the IA roadmap scenario, half of the technology for the hydrogen open the his error in the energy transition is not yet materialized. So we can take risk our destiny in the energy issue to new technology. But otherwise, what kind of a risk we can take it? So I said that we have to look at very carefully in the hydrogen, even future is a hydrogen data, but we don't have to uh, the overhaul them the, in the green utopia. Right. Well, do you think, um, is it too soon to make a judgment about what the timing and scale of hydrogen's contribution can be? Well, and uh, I think then, and the hydrogen is a new technology, but uh, we didn't look at what is uh, the cost of manufacturing cost in terms of a capex, opex, and uh, what the infrastructure we need, what's, what's the safety we're gonna face in the future. So we have to look at, when you look at the IEA said, uh, it's uh, the only one side of the plan. They only took, uh, uh, talking about the goals to reach the climate goal, climate and uh, challenges. But they didn't list uh, what cost involved. They said, this, I imagine this is $300 is uh, we have to pay for the invited hydrogen error. Right. Who gonna pay for this? Yeah, the cost uh, is really unknown at this point. Uh, yeah. given, if you're talking about scale, 
I noticed uh, yesterday an advertisement for a Korean car company that announced a hydrogen fueled mm -hmm. automobile. Do you think, um, do you at this point, and it's still early days, do you see hydrogen more being used as a transportation fuel or as a, as a power source, a heating source, or is it just your initial thoughts on that? My and uh, the immediate thought is uh, hydrogen should be used as a transportation fuel. As I said earlier, hydrogen is a secondary energy converted and manufactured from the, the primary energy or the electrolysis or the surplus the energy. So look at the, 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 the energy life cycle. Uh, you're gonna the, the, our, our product from the electrolysis, you're gonna put it into the, that uh, product into the raw material to generate the, uh, the, the electricity. That is a really, I mean, that, that's a, really, and uh, doesn't make sense at all. So what I'm saying is uh, hydrogen for time, unless and the, really in the breakthrough technology is uh, developed, hydrogen remain as a role of a transportation pool. But I mean, now is uh, maybe in the industry, the uses it can be used and yeah, mixed with a, the natural gas. Yeah, I was gonna say as an industrial fuel, I mean, obviously there's discussion of using hydrogen as a pipeline gas mm -hmm. uh, for industrial fuel use heating. That's I guess the third potential use for hydrogen. That's true, that's true. And uh, you know, the energy use is, uh, is a classified in the four use for power, heat, industrial and the chemical and the transportation. So the primary maybe, and the, I see the hydrogen start with the transportation fuel. Right. Because it is characteristically secondary energy. Right. Well, let me turn to um, a subject near and dear to your heart and indeed to all who are involved with the IGU, mm -hmm. which is the annual, the, the, the annual meeting, well, the meeting that's held every uh, few years. Uh, was due to be held last in, in May of 2021 in Seoul, but it of course was postponed because of the pandemic. Mm -hmm. uh, it's now scheduled for May of 2022, when hopefully everybody will be vaccinated and the, and the epidemic pandemic will be behind us. Mm -hmm. uh, tell us what you're thinking, what's in store for us at the uh, IGU meeting and uh, where the focus will be. Well, and uh, to hold the uh, world scale conference, uh, that place uh, should be safe and uh, the productive. In Korea, uh, so we are very successful in the reaching uh, the herd immunity by first part of November. Also, the, in the year of 2022, especially May, we might see uh, and the world scale energy related conference uh, will be first time. And the Sarah week has a really and a really and a big and their conference, uh, but uh, we did not have uh, exhibition. But the World Guest Conference is classified as a uh, guest Olympic. So I think that's uh, the, the theme wise. World Guest Conference is not only natural gas, it's all kinds of gas, also infrastructure and the technology related to shipbuilding and uh, auto industry. Korea is the right place to the, provide the, the platform, discuss all issues relevant to the gas industry. So I think this is uh, really in the right place to go. Well, uh, the World Gas Conference, I know is gonna have a, you talk about the exhibitions, it will have a big emphasis on technologies. Mm -hmm. Maybe just say another word about, uh, about that. Yeah, and uh, look at the, all the LNG, you know, the, the marine, uh, organ, I mean, the maritime organization saying that all the new ship will be driven by LNG because the most of the ship order uh, arrived to the, the Korean company is the LNG, vessel, LNG driven vessel. Also, auto Hyundai also initi initiated, they're going to, manufacturing car driven by hydrogen. So all the new technology there, I feel like the World Gas Conference is a living laboratory, the testing all new technology and the new thing in the coming decade. Right, well, I think, uh, I mean, uh, 
We all look forward to the World Gas Conference. As you say, it'll be very timely. And I think your phrase, uh, a living laboratory, will be uh, very much uh, true. And I think it'll also be a living uh, conference in that we all look forward to being there in person and being able to have all those informal discussions as well as the formal sessions that will make the World Gas Conference such a significant event in 2022. Mm -hmm. So uh, I join you uh, in looking forward to that. Uh, uh, Professor Kang, let me thank you very much for joining us now uh, for your, uh, the Sirwi conversation and for your very incisive comments. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dan, and uh, I'm looking forward to seeing you and uh, open dialogue of the key program in the World Gas Conference in 2022. Thank you. We've been talking with uh, Professor Joe Kang, who is the president of the International Gas Union. Thank you very much for joining us for this Sierra Week conversation brought to you by IHS Market. Thank you so much, Dan. See you soon. Thank you. See you. Thank you.